I'm Henk, and for the past seven years, I've gone on all sorts of adventures around the world. And wherever I went, I was showered in kindness, hospitality, and people that wanted to help. But when I came home and switched on the news, I saw a very different world. A rotten world filled with crime, hate, and selfishness. This wasn't the world I knew, and so I decided to walk across Europe and the Middle East without cash, credit card, or backup plan to prove that the world isn't nearly as rotten as you might think. Sandwiches, a beer, even some food for on the road. Oh, we got a Greek salad, souvlaki, we got french fries, all oh, thanks to these guys. But things weren't always easy. There was hunger and thirst, ant infestations and slug attacks, blisters on top of blisters, and an always present danger of animals that wanted to take my food. Along the way, I learned that the way you see the world and the way you see your problems depends entirely on what you choose to focus on. I would like to do a little experiment. I would like you all to look around the room and find every object that is colored red. Anything that is red, let it burn into your mind. Go ahead. Don't forget, I'm standing on a really big red circle here. I even put on a semi-red shirt. Some people are wearing red in the audience. All right, I hope you all have something. Now, I'd like you all to close your eyes. Everybody, close your eyes. Perfect. And now, all at the same time, I want you to call out all the different objects that are green. Hmm. <laughs> That's kind of difficult, isn't it? You can open your eyes again. As you can see, what you focus on is what you perceive. If you focus on all the things that are red, you don't notice all the things that are green. And that's because in our busy world, there's an unlimited amount of things that you can focus on. The person that just coughed, the guy standing up in the back, or maybe even the smelly feet of the person sitting next to you. There's simply too much that you can focus on. And so our brain narrows it down, makes it smaller, and we call that reality. Now keep this experiment in the back of your mind, because I'll come back to it later on. What I want to share with you guys today is how I was able to walk 6,000 kilometers without money, but also how being able to redirect your focus, like we just did, is the key to keep moving forward when things get tough in your life. So let's go on an adventure. This is the moment I left. I had been nervous for days because I had no idea if people Strangers would actually help me. Giving my father, my wallet, credit cards, and any remaining cash. I didn't want to have any backup because if things got really tough, if I got really hungry, and I had a credit card in my back pocket, well, then I would use it. But by leaving myself no way out, I was forcing myself to find the creativity, to find the resourcefulness within myself. And even though my father thought that I would be able to pull it off. He also thought that I was pretty crazy for doing it. <laughs> and the only reason is that my dad and I are very different. You see, seven years of round-the-world adventures have shown me that the world is a kind and generous place where people want to help you. But 40 years of round-the-world business have shown my dad that the world is a bad and rotten place where people will screw you over if you let them. And so part of the reason why I wanted to do this adventure was to show my dad and all the other cynics out there that the world isn't nearly as bad as what you see on TV. And so from this moment onwards, I was completely on my own. My plan was to walk from Holland, where I was born, crossing 13 countries all the way to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Well, first of all, I'd never been there before, and I always wanted to go. <laughs> and secondly, I love it when my adventures have some sort of historical or geographical significance. And by walking this route, I was walking pretty much the same route that the first crusaders walked in the first century. And I thought that's kind of cool. Now, at first, I was afraid to walk into restaurants and just ask for food. I had no idea how to do this, what to say. I was nervous and ashamed about it. So instead, I went into supermarkets and I started eating cheese. <laughs> I kept eating the cheese off the food samples until either the food ran out or people started looking at me a little bit sideways. I'd 
point, I would quickly move on to the next supermarket. <laughs> but eventually, hunger forced me to start ringing doorbells, because you need more than just cheese. And here's an overview of all the different foods that people would give me. Now, how would I do this? I would ring the doorbell, I would explain my journey, and I would make sure they understood I have no money. And I wouldn't actually ask them for food, but I would ask them to fill my water bottle. And interestingly, in the time it took them to walk to the kitchen, fill my water bottle, and walk back, they usually had the idea by themselves to offer me fruit, a sandwich, or even a hot meal. And that's when I realized people often need a little bit of space. They need some time to themselves to realize how they can help you. And by asking for water, they were by themselves in the kitchen, and that's when their brain started running. Wait a minute, this guy is walking without money? He must be, how is that possible? He must be hungry. Hey, I'm going to give him something to eat. And so for me, asking for water actually became a strategy to get fed. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, I wasn't just surviving, I was thriving. And in those first few weeks, I actually gained a little bit of weight, believe it or not. <laughs> but then everything changed, because then I reached France. <laughs> <laughs> we all know the French. <laughs> Just kidding, of course, the people in France were just as happy to help as the people in Holland and Belgium. In fact, in France, I had this black bag on the side of my backpack. And that was my food stash. It was my backup. So whenever people would give me food, I would put a little bit of that food to the side in that black bag, because I was sure at some point people were going to stop helping me. But over time, something very different happened. That bag became smaller and smaller, and smaller still, until eventually I got rid of it. And that was the moment I truly began to believe that the kindness of strangers is something you can reliably depend upon. So now I was really living from moment to moment, from day to day, trusting that people would help me. And in the weeks that followed, I made my way across France, across Switzerland, up through the Alps, and down into Italy. And that's where I met this family. Because in Italy, I found myself completely without food or water, and I was hungry. The problem is, as I walked past this farm, I saw the man here on the left. I saw him standing outside, working on his farm, and he looked very grumpy. <laughs> and I thought, there's no way this guy is going to help me. So I kept on walking. And you know, there's something you have to know about me. I'm somebody who always plans out his conversations. So if I want to ask my boss for a raise, or if I want to ask a woman out, I will first go through the conversation in my head. I will visualize it. And if I can't see it going well, I will just stand there with my drink. <laughs> I won't take action. But in this situation, I was so hungry, it forced me to turn around, walk back, and talk to the man anyway. And as soon as I did, he got a smile on his face, he invited me in, and I had lunch with him and his family. And I learned, I realized, you never know in what magical ways a conversation might flow. There's no way you can't predict this. So always ask, and that was a big lesson for me. Now you might be wondering, on a journey without money, how do you stay clean? Well, sometimes I would shower in lakes. <laughs> sometimes I would shower in between the beach tourists, and I quickly learned, if you're too dirty, people won't help you. If you're too clean, on the other hand, people won't help you either. <laughs> but there's this fine line. <laughs> of what's socially acceptable. And if you walk that line, people are going to help you a lot. <laughs> Where did I sleep? Well, a lot of times I slept on benches. Sometimes I would meet people, they would be so inspired by my journey that they would invite me into their homes. But most nights, I would sleep in my tent, wild camping. And a lot of people often ask me, weren't you afraid to camp in the wild? Because in a lot of countries in Europe, wild camping is illegal. And in the beginning, I was afraid, but over time, I realized I am that scary person that's sleeping under the bridge. <laughs> People are more afraid of me than I am of them. Because imagine, you're walking your dog in the morning, and suddenly, on the side of the road, in the bushes, you see this guy sleeping in a tent. <laughs> you're going to think, who is that weirdo? <laughs> that's me. <laughs> so people were more afraid of me than I was of them. And you know, even if I would have gotten arrested, I would have had a free bed and breakfast in jail. Perfect. Eventually, my journey brought me to Turkey. And in Turkey, I met a lot of Muslims, 
I've met a lot of Christians and also a lot of atheists. And no matter if they believed in God, Allah, or science, they all helped me with the same heartwarming kindness. Now I know what you're thinking, Hank, there's no way this journey could have been this easy. There must have been hard times, there must have been struggles. And yes, there were. There were days that I ate nothing. There were days that I ate dry bread. There was vitamin deficiency, which caused the skin on my hands to start peeling off. There were blisters on top of blisters, and there were days where my body just didn't want to continue. And the only way that I could get myself to keep moving forward in those moments was by reframing the situation, by redirecting my focus and trying to find the gift hidden inside the adversity, hidden inside the challenge, or even the pain. Like you saw at the beginning of my talk, when you focused on everything that was red, you didn't notice all the things that were green. In the same way, by focusing on the benefit in those situations, that became my reality. Now, it's really hard to explain how I exactly do this, so I created a short video for you guys that outlines all the different moments where I was struggling, and if you listen closely, you'll hear me reframe the situation every time. Here we go. Within every setback, problem, or challenge lies a hidden gift. You can focus on why your situation sucks, why it's unfair, or why you're the victim. Or you can reframe it and focus on why it's actually great. This isn't positive thinking. This is taking control of the story you tell yourself. My comb is slowly falling apart, but on the upside, it does mean my backpack is getting a little bit lighter every single day. I'm here in Turkey, it's really hot, and I ran out of water. I'm considering drinking the water from the bottles I find on the side of the road. Maybe one day this will make a great story. Can you live on nothing but sunlight? When I didn't eat anything for about two days, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to bust this myth. Nah, I'm still hungry. Oh man, my tent is infested by ants. Oh no, wait, they're actually cleaning up my tent. That's amazing. Every morning, my tent is covered in slugs. It's disgusting. But then again, it's really satisfying to flick them off. My electronics are slowly falling apart. And this is great because without screens as a distraction, I'll have no choice but to be in the present moment. Walking on blisters is incredibly painful. But again, this is great because if I can endure this, then whatever else my life might throw at me, I'll be able to handle it. As you can see, what you focus on creates your reality. And it didn't take long before this skill was put to the test once again. You see, as I was walking through Turkey, I had to make a choice. Am I going to walk via Syria or am I going to walk via Cyprus, the island? Now, I couldn't walk via Syria because of the war. So my only other option was to walk via Cyprus. But that meant I would have to take a boat. And a boat costs money, something I didn't have. And to make matters worse, when I actually got to the harbor, it turned out the last ferry of the season had already left, so I was stuck. I was stranded, and I thought my journey was pretty much over. But then I decided to redirect my focus again and focus on how I had gotten this far. And I quickly saw that the only way I had gotten this far was by meeting other people, by trusting them. So I quickly went back into the city, and I started telling everyone about my journey. I tried to connect with them through stories, through magic tricks, one of my hobbies. And it didn't take long before different people came together and offered me a f cheap flight ticket. Amazing. And so eventually, after almost 200 days, fueled by nothing but the kindness of strangers and a little bit of my own creativity, I managed to reach Israel and eventually Jerusalem. And when I touched the Western Wall, my journey had truly come to an end. My parents were there, journalists were there from Holland and Israel, and I felt that I had proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that the world isn't nearly as bad as what you see on TV. And since my father was there, I was curious to find out if following my journey had changed his mind. Here's what he had to say. So dad, you've been following my journey to Jerusalem. Do you still think the world is a bad place? Yes, I believe there are a lot of good people, but still there are a lot of burnt rotten people. And the world is rotten. <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> and
And you know, he's right. There are a lot of bad people in the world. A lot of rotten things do happen, but a lot of good things happen as well. And here's the thing. You get to choose what you focus on. You can choose to see a bad world, or you can choose to see a good world. And when it comes to your problems or challenges, you can choose to focus on why it sucks. You can ask questions like, why does it have to happen to me? Or you can reframe it, ask a different question. Why is this the greatest thing that ever happened to me? You see, your brain is a giant supercomputer. Whatever question you put in, it will spit out an answer. Now guys, if you remember one thing from my talk today, let it be this. In life, it doesn't matter what happens to you. What matters is how you choose to react to it. If you can find the gift hidden inside the adversity, problem, or even pain, you become unstoppable. Thank you.